hppodcraft.com. From even the greatest of horrors, irony is seldom absent. That is the opening line of The Shunned House by H.P. Lovecraft. I'm Chad Pfeiffer, one of the shunned hosts of the H.P. Lovecraft Literary <laughs> Podcast. I'm, I'm Chris Lackey. I don't, I don't believe I'm shunned in any way, and I don't really think you are either. That's true. Who was that uh, reader we just heard? That is none other than Michael Holmes. Ah, oh, glad to have for, him back. Yeah, yeah, he's back and uh, doing a great job. Yeah. That opening sentence, well, it's an interesting opening notion, and, it, and it's true. I, I agree. You know, I often say that horror and, and comedy are very similar and that they set up an expectation, and then mm-hmm. they break that expectation in order to produce an emotional effect right. in, in the audience. Although people will frequently disagree about the exact definition of irony, usually after they've listened to an Alanis Morissette song. <laughs> Uh, on the radio but in its rawest form irony was basically when a situation or event turns out other than expected yeah you know, it's I'm, very simple it's, very it's, simple. it's not a, it's not a complicated concept in, in Lovecraft that frequently means you know I've investigated this horrible family turns out I'm part of the family <laughs> or you know there's the painter and he's got the best imagination but as it turns out he's painting stuff from the real world you yeah. know this, these are the Lovecraftian ironies in this story it's that he sets it up as a horror story not scary in the slightest <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to just jump in. Uh, yeah. Just, I want to be uh, upfront about this. Is This story, I think, is, is terrible. Yeah. Um, it, it was so hard to read yeah. and so hard to reread. I liked the last kind of two parts of the story. That's yeah. when it finally got good and interesting. But, man, oh, man, this is a tough one. So let's... Yeah. If you have ADD, you're going to have some trouble with this. Oh, my God. When reading this story, which happens occasionally with Lovecraft, I will have read two pages and not actually read the two pages that yeah. my eyes are going over the words but i'm thinking about something else i'm so glad you say that out loud <laughs> the irony that lovecraft is actually referring to is uh, that edgar Allan poe mm-hmm. used to walk the streets of providence in the 1840s mm-hmm. when he was uh wooing the poetess sarah whitman this was after his wife had died and, mm-hmm. and he was going after a couple of different ladies but whitman mrs whitman for a while was a object of his affection yeah. and on his way walking to her house he used to pass the certain residence uh-huh. the titular residence <laughs> I like saying titular which he hints is this terrible horrible place and so it's ironic that the master of the macabre walked by it all the time and he didn't even notice it we think one interesting thing about it too is that this by the shunned house there's a 18th century cemetery the hillside churchyard of, of St. John's and Lovecraft used to really go to the cemetery all the time mm-hmm. like it was one of his favorite places when he had people visit from out of town he even took this woman there one night and told her ghost stories. Her name was Helen Sully. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And eventually, Helen hooked up with Clark Ashton Smith. Oh, like okay. they were an item. Even really? though she was married and they were having an affair. But anyway, some for some reason, Whoa. which isn't explained, Lovecraft takes her out into a cemetery at night uh-huh. and he tells her a creepy story and she gets so scared she runs out of the cemetery. Oh my god. That cemetery. Wow. Yeah. And then she wound up with Clark Ashton Smith. Eventually ended up with, hooking up with Cl- uh, Clark wow. Ashton Smith. I had no idea that kind of thing was going on. That's like a George Harrison and uh, Eric Clapton <laughs> kind of thing. That's great. <laughs> this is a longer story for Lovecraft, actually. Oh, it, it's it, it's in five parts. Yeah, five chapters. The story was never published in Lovecraft's lifetime. He tried to get it published in Weird Tales, but the guy was like, forget it. It's lame. But W. Paul Cook from Recluse Press loved it and he was going to publish it and it was going to be Lovecraft's first published book. It got printed, um, all the pages got printed, but then none, of, none of them ever got bound. So there was uh, 150 sets of, of this printed book that just basically sat around and it never got made into a book. And those books ended up going to Arkham House mm-hmm. in 1959, all those stacked up, those boxes of papers of printed things. And 50 copies of the Unbound book were sold. And then the, the rest of them, the because there was 150. By total, Arkham House? By Arkham House. Uh. And then the last 100 copies were bound by Arkham House. And then they were printed and stuff like that. So supposedly mm-hmm. that is one of the rarest like Lovecraft That's pretty cool. things out there. So there's like 100 bound copies and 50 unbound copies supposedly floating around out there somewhere. Uh. If they still exist. Speaking sure. of things which still exist, the Shunned House still exists. It does. Out there in Providence. Now, I, I think that... Lovecraft had based the story somewhat off of a house in a different location, but yeah. the shunned house was actually a physical residence that one of his relatives had been in. Yeah, his aunt. His aunt Lillian Clark uh-huh. lived there before. And uh, we'll we'll post a picture of the house on, on our site so you can have a look at it, but I could see how people would find it a little creepy. The house that he actually got the idea for the story specifically, I think he mixed this up with... but with another house that he saw Mm -hmm. when he was in New Jersey. He talks about it in a letter. On the northeast corner of Bridge Street and Elizabeth Avenue 
is a terrible old house, a hellish place where night black deeds must have been done in the early 1700s. So he so he was impressed by the house in New Jersey. Yeah. But he was used the house he was more familiar with. Right. In Providence, which I'm sure the people who live in that house now are very happy that it's called a shut house. <laughs> and weirdos like us are probably standing around outside all the Taking time. Pictures Taking pictures and stuff, yeah. yeah. Once he introduced this weird irony that Poe passed it all the time and never remarked on it, he goes in to describe the house. And just the important detail is that it's a two-story kind of farmhouse that's been around for a long time. And at some point, there was a widening of the street that it's on, which exposed its foundation mm -hmm. on one side, so that the cellar of the house now has a door and some windows that go out to the street. Right. What I heard in my youth about the shunned house was merely that people died there in alarmingly great numbers. It was plainly unhealthy, perhaps because of the dampness and fungus growth in the cellar, the general sickish smell, the drafts of the hallways, or the quality of the well and pump water. Only the notebooks of my antiquarian uncle, Dr. Elihu Whipple, revealed to me at length the darker, vaguer surmises which formed an undercurrent of folklore among old-time servants and humble folk. Surmises which never traveled far, and which were largely forgotten when Providence grew to be a metropolis with a shifting modern population. The general fact is that the house was never regarded by the solid part of the community as in any real sense haunted. There were no widespread tales of rattling chains, cold currents of air, extinguished lights, or faces at the window. Extremists sometimes said the house was unlucky, but that is as far as even they went. Dr. Elihu Whipple, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah, hopefully Elihu is the way it is. Elihu Whipple seems to be obviously based off of his grandfather, oh, who Lovecraft. was Whipple Phillips. But also, Lovecraft had two uncle-in-laws, the guys that married his aunts, Dr. Franklin Chase Clark and Edward Francis Gamwell. So Dr. Clark was actually a doctor, not unlike this character, Dr. who Whipple. is the Dr. Whipple, who is a doctor. So it seems to be an amalgam of kind of his father figures. The house isn't traditionally haunted by ghosts, but what Lovecraft points out is that the people who live there, whatever malady they might be susceptible to, it gets really accelerated. The house eventually became very difficult to rent, and it's been vacant for the last 60 years as of the time of this writing. When our protagonist was a kid, you know, he and his buddies used to get in there and dare each other to climb around in the attic, but it, it was the cellar that really freaked them out, and, and seems to freak most people out. It smelled really bad. There was mold and white fungus growth everywhere. Toadstools and uh, Indian pipes, which right. are just kind of like leafless herbs. So they're like kind of like big whitish cylinders. Oh, I'm, that's I, what that is? I'm doing, yeah, I'm doing okay. like a, a, a hand motion here. You're making which, a really... Which uh, looks sort of yeah. uh, profane, but it it's, it's, you know, it's one of those. In particular, this deposit of mold on the floor of the cellar, which is inconsistent in shape, but... It sometimes looks like a doubled up human figure. Once when the protagonist was looking at it when he was a kid, he, he saw this thin yellowish kind of exhalation rising from it toward mm -hmm. the fireplace. Yeah, yeah. And, and later his uncle told him, well, this is somewhat related to old tales about the house. So that's the information you get in the first chapter. I have to admit that already though, I thought, well, people are probably dying because of the toxic mold in the basement. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking yeah. when I was reading. I'm like, it, they have, it's toxic mold, it's making them sick. Right, or some kind of carbon monoxide poisoning. Ex I thought the exact to same go, thing too, yeah. yeah. So anyway, we're, we're into the second chapter, where we really introduce the protagonist's uncle, Dr. Whipple. We learn that he's this older guy, he's got a ton of notes about the shunned house, but he never shared them with his nephew while the nephew was young, because, mm -hmm. I mean, he obviously didn't want to freak him out. Right. He describes Dr. Whipple's account of the house's history as long-winded, statistical, and drearily genealogical, which is exactly <laughs> how I felt about this chapter of the story. Yeah. <laughs> like, what was up with that? I, when I read that... I was like, wait, Lovecraft's calling it out, and then yeah. he does it. I know, I thought he was calling it out in, as in a way to say, but I'm not going to get into that business, you know, here's yeah. the highlights. And then he gets in that business. He gets into that business. Now, right here in the opening of the second chapter, Lovecraft previews for the reader that he and his uncle will eventually go into this house. Yeah. And that he's the only one that comes out of it. Mm -hmm. So we know that his uncle is going to die or disappear. Again, tipping his hand. Yeah, but and also solidifying the lesson of Lovecraft, which is don't do research and don't study. <laughs> you know. But here, here, here are the basics of the house. It was built by William Harris, who came with his wife, Roby, Dexter, and a mess of kids. He's a sailor. He's a master of a brig. And that gets him a good enough salary to build the house. And I believe that William Harris is actually a real person. Yes. Almost immediately, a couple of the kids die upon moving into this house of some infantile fever or wasting away, as do a couple of the servants. William Harris himself dies shortly after, although not because of the house. He says it's because of the climate in Martinique where he has to travel all the time. Right, Well, which is not true. Because the real, <laughs> the real William Harris, when he 
he died. He was actually, he was kidnapped by pirates and ransomed, which is a much more what? interesting Why didn't they use that? I don't know. Oh man. He was ransomed by pirates and then the, they paid the money and then he died on his way back on the ship because I guess the pirates didn't take good care enough. He got sick and he died. So like, what? Why? What? If you, why would you avoid having a pirate in a story if you could have a pirate? I know. Oh well, when uh, uh, when his wife Roby's firstborn dies a couple of years after William's death, she kind of goes nuts and she gets confined to the upper part of the house, all Jane Eyre style. Now her older sister Mercy, who's an old maid, shows up. Uh, well, she's not old maid. <laughs> she's a, she's a, she never got married. Yeah. So she so, shows up to come in and watch over the surviving son. And of course, her health takes on a decline, although it happens very slowly. Another servant dies, another takes off, and so she hires some other folks. One is a woman named Anne White from a town over. It was Anne White who first gave definite shape to this sinister idol talk. Mercy should have known better than to hire anyone from the Neusneck Hill Country, for that remote bit of backwoods was then, as now, a seat of the most uncomfortable superstitions. As lately as 1892, an Exeter community exhumed a dead body and ceremoniously burnt its heart in order to prevent certain alleged visitations injurious to the public health and peace. And one may imagine the point of view of the same section in 1768. This little bit here that uh, Lovecraft brings up actually happened. That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's really cool. They dug up this body in uh, 1892 and uh, for some reason thought that it had like was cursed or it was some supernatural thing with it, and they uh, freaking killed the guy. In 1892. That's really recent. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> okay. Well, that's uh, so that's some, see, that's some good Dracula stuff. And that's cool history, but for some reason, Lovecraft, for me, totally dropped the ball on this, yeah. man. It's not good writing. Now, Anne is starting to annoy everybody so because she talks too much this superstition just garbage so they get rid of her bring in another servant that servant I mean you can see the pattern here these servants are like red shirts from Star Trek they just keep coming in (laughs) dying dying. or going insane yeah the son William is thankfully spending time away from the house with his cousin and his mother is only getting worse the really odd thing about his mom up there in the top of the house is that she's starting to scream in French all the time but Uh, she doesn't know French even though she doesn't know French and talking about some staring thing that bites and chews on her there's some neat stuff going on and that's cool and then and that's that that was the first point in the story where I was like, okay, it's not a uh, toxic fungus. It's not toxic mold. Yeah, because usually toxic mold doesn't, you know, endow you with the ability to <laughs> speak French. No. So eventually she dies. Her son William makes it off to the Revolutionary War, which is like the only time in history where going off to war was a good thing, you know, right. for the kid. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then in the subsequent passages, there's there's lots of history about things that were going on then. William comes back from the war. He decides not to live in the house since Mercy and the remaining servant have passed away. He decides to move somewhere else. But unfortunately, he gets the yellow fever and he and his wife die. <laughs> uh, so I guess even not living in the shunned house, it was just really easy to die back yeah. then. So their son, Duty, gets brought up by a, a cousin who rents the house out since William isn't there to stop him. Is pronounced Duty? It. What do you think it is? I thought it was Duddy for some reason. But Maybe it's I guess Duddy. Duty. Well, because Duty. <laughs> <laughs> well, not... Yeah, Duty, like Duty to your country. Right. Well, come on, Duty's son is welcome. <laughs> I know. You know? These are some great names, though. Which I'll give really, the story. These are great names. They have a lot of good names, and I'm sure they're all historically yeah. relevant names. They're right. popular names at the times. Welcome and Duddy or Duty. Yeah. That's like I knew a guy who had an uncle named Brother, which I thought was great. His <laughs> uncle, brother. So Duty, if that's his name, or Duddy, whatever. He allows the house to be rented out, and there's a bunch of renters who move in. I mean, at least he doesn't go into all these people, but they're all dying and getting yeah. sick. So the town council orders him to fumigate the place, but mm-hmm. of course that doesn't really help. Doesn't do anything. The duty goes off and he serves in the War of 1812, and as, as I just said, he has his own son, Welcome, and that's the son that's born on the night of the Great Gale. Yeah, and that was a real event that happened in Providence. Basically, the storm was so huge and made this huge big tidal wave that went into the town. This yeah. whole wind blew all this water up and like knocked all these houses down. It was just this crazy thing, and it's well documented historically that, that it happened. There's a huge flood in the streets, and I think ships are even coming up and knocking on the windows while yeah, the son uh-huh. is born, which is kind of an interesting scene. Welcome grows up. He unfortunately dies in the Civil War. And his son, Archer, you know, he doesn't really know that the house is a bad spot. So no. he continues to let it be rented. Until 1861. And that's, right, when, right. that's when they finally stop. And that's the end of the second chapter. Yeah. Except that the, in, the, in the very end, they also tip at the hand a little bit. And he says, well, the horror is gone now. We know that the uncle's not coming back from it whenever they visit. Yeah. And we know that whatever happens there ends the whole thing. It gets resolved yeah. in some way. On to chapter three. three. 
So in chapter 3, the protagonist talks about how affected he was by all this research. He gives some fun details that the servant, Anne White, the superstitious one, she had a theory that there were vampires in the house. Yeah. Which is probably the first time Lovecraft has directly hinted that a vampire is responsible. For yeah. Uh -huh. And in a way, the, the story is his take on the vampire legend. Our narrator says that people who were dying in the house were complaining of wasting away. They were saying that breaths were sucked away at night. In 1804, the death certificates of four people who had died of fever in the house... Their death certificates said that they were lacking in blood. Those death certificates were issued by Dr. Chad Hopkins, who sounds really reputable to me. Uh, <laughs> great name. Uh, and, and even some of the residents who went crazy in the house tried to bite at their doctors or, mm -hmm. or tried to kill their relatives by cutting at their wrists and, and necks. And, and necks, yeah, yeah. The thing that piques the uncle's interest, though, is the ignorant people who started to move in there because they're the only ones that didn't understand the legends of right. the thing. They started babbling in French when yeah. they lived in the which there's no way they could have known because they were ignorant, ignorant. immigrant oh, immigrants. fools. Oh. Now, our, <laughs> our protagonist takes his uncle's research about the house. Because once the uncle found out about the French stuff, he's like, I don't know all about this place. Our protagonist reads it all, and then he goes to the family, the surviving members of the family, and gets it confirmed. But he's having a hard time getting even more than just rumors about where that French language stuff is coming from. So he keeps digging, and eventually he discovers that the plot of ground on which the house is built was once owned by some French immigrants mm -hmm. in the late 1600s. Yeah, before the Harrises move in or built yeah, their before house. Yeah, before the Harris, before they built the house there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, this this he discovers this family, this French family had a house there, and that plot that the house was built on was probably their family graveyard. Right. And the roulettes. Yeah, the <laughs> roulettes. <laughs> I assume that it's or roulets. Uh, roulet. Yeah. yeah. In my head, every time I saw the word, I was going roulet. Like, <laughs> Thinking of uh, Will Ferrell's uh, Robert Goulet impression. Oh. <laughs> Etienne, Roulet. Roulet. Etienne Roulet is the, the patron of this family. Etienne and his family, they were Huguenots. The Huguenots were the French middle class Protestants. And mm. when Henry the Fourth was in, in control, he wanted the French Protestants to kind of have some power. So he made this, this the edict, the Edict of Knots. They were given like property and land and they actually, you know, became powerful, so to speak. Gotcha. And then in 1685, when Louis XIV got in there, he said, you know what? I don't like you Protestants. Out of here. And mm -hmm. so he canceled the edict, and they lost a lot of their stuff, and so they kind of fled to the United States. Gotcha. And the Huguenots, I, I don't think that was a self-selected name. Nobody really knows the exact origin, but I think that it was kind of uh, not a nice no, term. No, probably not. So these, these particular Huguenots, and they hint that they were, I mean, they were really Protestant. <laughs> <laughs> they were so Protestant that it's... Hard to say whether they were followers of uh, God or, oh, right, or, or Christ. Right. Though oh, right, it, yeah. it says in the text that Etienne was more adept at reading queer books and drawing queer diagrams than he was at you know agriculture. So there's something paganistic uh -huh. or strange about what they do. Right, right. But in Providence, they're they're cool with it, and they allow him to get some land. And um, Etienne even gets a job. A guy named Tillinghast hires him, mm -hmm. which I thought was interesting. Uh, Crawford Tillinghast being from. From beyond. From beyond. And the, you know, the Roulets do all right. Although after, it says that sometime after Etienne's death, there had been some kind of riot mm -hmm. in Providence, which seems to eradicate the family. And most of that centered around Etienne's son, Paul Roulet. Etienne's son, Paul, a surly fellow whose erratic conduct had probably provoked the riot, which wiped out the family, was particularly a source of speculation. And though Providence never shared the witchcraft panics of her Puritan neighbors, was freely intimated by old wives that his prayers were neither uttered at the proper time nor directed toward the proper object. I wondered how many of those who had known the legends realized that additional link with the terrible which my wide reading had given me, that ominous item in the annals of morbid horror which tells of the creature Jacques Rollet of Cope who in 1598 was condemned to death as a demonic, but afterwards saved from the stake by the Paris Parliament and shut in a madhouse. He had been found covered with blood and shreds of flesh in a wood, shortly after the killing and rending of a boy by a pair of wolves. One wolf was seen to lope away unhurt. Surely a pretty hearthside tale, with a queer significance to the name and place, but I decided that the Providence gossips could not have generally known of it. Had they known, the coincidence of names would have brought some drastic and frightened action. Indeed, might not its limited whispering have precipitated the final riot which erased the roulette from the town? So, uh, that's kind of, this is kind of a uh, the werewolf story. Yeah, French yeah. werewolves. 
French werewolves. And you know, from my reading, I know there were actually quite a few French werewolves at the time. Jean Grenier was a guy who mm-hmm. was uh, convicted of being a werewolf after he killed children in the early 1600s. Oh, right. Happened a lot. In fact, I was reading a story in 1572 near the French city of Dole. The local court of parliament passed a law permitting the people of the district to hunt werewolves, even Whoa. though it wasn't the regular hunting season. <laughs> That is just an amusing sentence in and of itself. Anyway, that was a connection to a man named Gilles Garnier, who was uh, burned to death for the offense. He he said he met a man in the woods who taught him to become a wolf, and he had killed several children and, and was apparently serving them to his family. Wow. Because they were poor. Yeah, I guess it was sort of, you know, how like there was the satanic panic in the 80s. Exactly. In the, in the, uh, in, in the, in the, in the, the 1570s, yeah, in the late 1500s, late, late early 1600s, 1600s, there was a werewolf panic. Werewolf going. panic in France. And, uh, and so those are two werewolves, but, but this guy, Jacques Roulet, real guy. Yeah, oh yeah, it's a real dude. And again, this is Lovecraft, you know, taking all this folklore and history and weaving it into this, into the story. This news about all this information about the Roulets finally connects itself to the French speaking, and that really gets our narrator all turned on, uh-huh. gets, his, gets his uncle aroused as well. So mm-hmm. he visits the house. <laughs> well, that's what he says. He does say So, uh, well. you know, our narrator starts visiting the house more and more. On his uncle's recommendation, he does it at night, and he sees again that strange vapor come up from the, the shape on the floor. And so, the phosphorescence uh, from, the, uh, yeah. from the fungus, some of it glows, which exactly. is the witch fire is what they call it. Witch fire! <laughs> um, so he and his uncle, they go, you know what, we got to get in there and investigate and possibly destroy whatever's in there. Uh huh. Which brings us to chapter four. I should mention it's like 1919, and the uncle is 81 years old. He's an old guy. Yeah. It's funny. He says he, he the doctor had followed his own advice all his life, so he's really healthy. But I'm like, <laughs> what advice is that? Smoke cigarettes and eat red meat. You know. <laughs> Jeff, I've had the health. So they go in. They decide we're going to perch there all night. We're going to see what happens. So they bring in a couple of chairs and they bring in a cot. A cot. Those are the most normal things they bring in. And then they bring in two flamethrowers. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is one insane like how they got them and two it's a really bad idea they're gonna just set the house on fire uh, they're not used in the story right. they but just in case they have these flamethrowers because they don't know what they're dealing with here yeah. so they go well supposedly in the folklore they would burn the heart and so if we set it on fire maybe that'll kill it although yeah I, but I found that funny because he says now we don't believe in werewolves or vampires or anything yeah but they seem pretty prepared for werewolves and vampires, vampires <laughs> exactly well um, and then the other thing that they bring along crooks tubes yeah a crook's tube. I don't know what that is. What a is crook's that? tube is a vacuum tube invented in 1875 by Sir William Crook. It's basically used to demonstrate cathode rays, which are okay. electrons, basically. So, so it's, it's almost like a, like a Ghostbusters. Uh, proton pack. Proton almost, pack, yeah. Yeah. Except it's an electron pack, yeah. sort of. So they're going to try cool. and electrocute it if... You know, if it doesn't have a physical form, they can't right. burn it, they're going to try and do this. Now, our narrator does have a sort of pseudoscientific theory about what the menace might be in the house that I thought was interesting. He says, uh, Such a thing was surely not a physical or biochemical impossibility in the light of a newer science, which includes the theories of relativity and intraatomic action. One might easily imagine an alien nucleus of substance or energy, formless or otherwise, kept alive by imperceptible or immaterial subtractions from the life force or bodily tissues and fluids of other and more palpably living things into which it penetrates, and with whose fabric it sometimes completely merges itself. It might be actively hostile, or it might be dictated merely by blind motives of self-preservation. In any case, such a monster must of necessity be in our scheme of things an anomaly and an intruder, whose extirpations forms a primary duty with every man not an enemy to the world's life, health, and sanity. So this is his vampire. Right, yeah. yeah it's yeah. like an interdimensional cellular Which is force. very, very Lovecraftian and uh, kind of interesting, kind of cool, but... From a storytelling uh, standpoint, it's total conjecture. Like, he just came up with this. is like his idea. No, his first and only theory is the exact case. Right. <laughs> All he's done is some historical research. There's no empirical evidence to support any of this yeah. stuff. Like, he just goes, well, you know, I read some stuff that Einstein was doing, and you know what makes me think? It's this. Yeah. And it's, then that's exactly what it is. And that's exactly what it is. so crazy. Our narrator and his uncle, they get all set up like uh, the ghost hunters down in the basement. <laughs> right. Yeah. Hey, bro. Bro, I'm really afraid there's some cellular vampires in here, bro. I, 
Bro, I really, I think I felt a cellular vampire touch me. <laughs> and, and the door to the upstairs, they lock, but the door from the cellar to the street, they open in case they need to run away from whatever this is. They got their their two their two chairs and their cot. And the whole plan is, so one's going to sleep for two hours, and then the other one's going to sleep for two hours. They're going to take shifts. But they're, they get really, they get there at 10 o'clock at night, but they're so excited and f- freaked out and, you know, seeing kind of strange things and feeling stuff that they don't, the uncle doesn't start to go to sleep until like after midnight. He starts having nightmares. He starts having a nightmare. Yeah. All at once, he commenced to mutter, and I did not like the look of his mouth and teeth as he spoke. The words were at first indistinguishable, and then, with a tremendous start, I recognized something about them, which filled me with icy fear till I recalled the breadth of my uncle's education and the interminable translations he had made from anthropological and antiquarian articles in the Revue des Deux Mondes. For the venerable Elihu Whipple was muttering in French, and the few phrases I could distinguish seemed connected with the darkest myths he had ever adapted from the famous Paris magazine. <laughs> the uncle switches to English when he wakes up, and he says, my breath, my breath. Because whatever he was dreaming was taking his breath from him. And he talks about his dream a little bit. He says, I was dreaming this crazy geometrical... Yeah, like he's shooting through a kaleidoscope or something. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and then eventually he also dreamed of laying in an open pit with a bunch of three-corner hatted colonials looking Colonials, down exactly. So the uncle has that terrible nightmare and he goes, yeah, I think I'm going to stay up for a while. Uh, <laughs> he didn't even do his two hours. So our guy says, cool, I'm going to take a nap. He falls asleep. He starts having nightmares. Which is, you know, this again, this is ridiculous. Who could sleep through this? Yeah, I know. You had those terrible nightmares? See ya. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to sleep yeah. too. And uh, and that brings us to our concluding chapter, chapter five. Yes, This chapter opens with the narrator, the sleeper, being awaked by this terrible smell and the screams of his uncle. Yeah. The sight was worse than I had dreaded. There are horrors beyond horrors, and this was one of those nuclei of all dreamable hideousness which the cosmos saves to blast an accursed and unhappy few. Out of the fungus-ridden earth streamed up a vaporous corpse light, yellow and diseased, which bubbled and lapped to a gigantic height in vague outlines half-human and half-monstrous, through which I could see the chimney and fireplace beyond. It was all eyes, wolfish and mocking, and the ragose insect-like head dissolved at the top to a thin stream of mist which curled putridly about and finally vanished up the chimney. I, I say that I saw this thing, but it is only in conscious retrospection that I ever definitely traced its damnable approach to form. At the time, it was to me only a seething, dimly phosphorescent cloud of fungus loathsomeness enveloping and dissolving to an abhorrent plasticity the one object to which all my attention was focused. That object was my uncle, the venerable Elihu Whipple, who with blackening and decaying features leered and gibbered at me, and reached out dripping claws to rend me in the fury which this horror had brought. Oh, man, ghastly. Yeah, bad ghastly. news. That's, yeah, that's some pretty nasty stuff. And he was going to use the flamethrower on him, but, but then he thought, ah, my uncle's in there. It's my uncle. Yeah, so he, he whips out the crook uh, tube or yeah, whatever, yeah. whatever it's called. He shoots that at him. But it doesn't do anything. Totally ineffectual. Totally useless. The monstrosity continues on, and in it he begins to see all the faces of the people who died over time. Right, yeah, he notices um, people from different paintings. He sees faces of some of the servants who died. He, he just realizes that everybody that's been killed or consumed by this thing has somehow been incorporated. Into right, right, yeah. and then eventually comes around to his uncle's and face, uncle. which in a moment he feels is almost saying farewell to him. Right. He certainly says farewell. He just beats it out of there. He runs away. <laughs> He's getting, he splits. And from what I can tell, he just kind of wanders around Providence all night until dawn. You know, but the last thing, before he splits, the body, like, melts. Yeah, yeah. The body melts and seeps into the ground. Right, right. And, he, and that's enough for him. He gets out of there. He but, gets out of there. And when he yeah. comes back in the, in the dawn, uncle completely gone. There's just sort of an oily spot on the floor. Right. He says, you know what? I, I got to annihilate whatever's under that shape on the floor. So he goes home, orders up a pickaxe, a spade, a gas mask, <laughs> and uh, some sulfuric acid. And, uh-huh. you know, he says, bring it over to that house the next day. And then he shows up ready to party. Yeah. When he goes the next morning to yep. attack this thing, he basically gets the pickaxe and he starts making this giant hole or yeah, pit. Yeah, it's like six by six. Yeah, yeah, around where that shape was on the floor. Uh-huh. And he arranges all the carboys around the hole so right. that... You know, something pops up, you can just start. He can just throw acid on it. Yeah. 
So he's got that all set up, he starts digging, and then... Suddenly my spade struck something softer than earth. I shuddered, and made a motion as if to climb out of the hole, which was now deep as my neck. Then courage returned, and I scraped away more dirt in the light of the electric torch I had provided. The surface I had uncovered was fishy and glassy, a kind of semi-putrid congealed jelly with suggestions of translucency. I scraped further, and saw that it had form. There was a rift where a part of the substance was folded over. The exposed area was huge and roughly cylindrical like a mammoth, soft, blue-white stovepipe doubled in two, its largest part some two feet in diameter. Still more I scraped. And then abruptly I leaped out of the hole and away from the filthy thing, frantically unstopping and tilting the heavy carboys and precipitating their corrosive contents one after another down that charnel gulf and upon the unthinkable abnormality whose titan elbow I had seen. Whoa. Now, basically, he sees a huge elbow. I was yeah, surprised like it was big. Yeah, it's gigantic. It's like it was like two feet thick. Just the elbow yeah, of it so was. It's, so that's... It's, it's been growing or, or something. Yeah. Like, you know, all of these people that it's been eating. It's been eating, yeah. And this sort of makes me makes me think of under the pyramids a little bit. You know, where it's mm. like you get a hint of this thing. Yep, and you just bigger. see the elbow. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's enough for me. And he pours the acid in and starts dissolving it. Of course, he faints. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even with the gas mask. Even with the um, gas mask, he faints. Wakes up again. While he's fainted, I mean, you know, something... Uh, people in Providence remember, actually, when this happened because they remember yeah. some kind of discharge going into the water. Yeah, they thought it was some kind of uh, river. factory waste dumped. In, yeah. yeah and, and they hear some kind of roar or explosion when it happens. Uh-huh. Anyway, when he wakes from his swoon, he uh, he finishes <laughs> filling in the hole. Well, because he sees what... He was poured the, the acid on. It's gone. Yeah. And then he concludes the story by saying, The next spring, no more pale grass and strange weeds came up in the shunned house's terraced garden. And shortly afterward, Carrington Harris rented the place. It is still spectral, but its strangeness fascinates me. And I shall find, mixed with my relief, a queer regret when it is torn down to make way for a tawdry shop or vulgar apartment building. The barren old trees in the yard have begun to bear small sweet apples. And last year, the birds nested in their gnarled boughs. So, for once, a happy ending. It's a happy ending. Yeah. And even, it's happier still that even the narrator doesn't know this, but nobody did knock down the house to make it. Yeah, it's still a, there. Yeah, it's still there. It's so. still there. There's the line right before that, that mm -hmm. last part. Uh, he says, I shed the first of the many tears with which I had paid unaffected tribute to my beloved uncle's memory. Which is pretty emotional. Yeah. And not common for Lovecraft at all. Yeah. I would say that the only other time that we get something like that is the Rats in the Walls. Right. You know? Actually, I thought it was when, when the uncle was kind of forming the face and he thought he said farewell. And yeah. And he said, I kind of choked out a farewell as well. I yeah. thought it was more emotional than usual. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Too. Absolutely. So there's some interesting things in this. Yeah. Uh, but that's the end of the story, by that the way. That is the yeah, end of the story? There's nothing more of that. I feel like that this was sort of a, another version of Rats in the Walls mm -hmm. and not as good. There's some interesting stuff There's some in cool here. stuff, yeah. definitely. It could be probably three-fifths the length. You know what I mean? Like you cut out a bunch of that stuff and just focus on the... And that would be pretty cool, but it was a tough story. Also, uh, it's got that fine tradition of a um, house being built on an old... Burial ground? Burial ground, yeah. yeah or cemetery. <laughs> so that always causes trouble. Yeah. Always. Don't uh, don't disrespect the dead. Yeah, especially in, dead in sorcerers. Fact, yeah, it, well, there was one part in the story uh, when he said, "I looked back through the records and I saw everything since this place has been settled. Now, uh, nothing there." So I went even further back to see what the Indians had been doing back there, and I thought, "Oh man, this is definitely going to be an Indian burial ground." Uh -huh. Then it was Huguenots. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, no, no Indian burial. Ground. Oh well, sorry. All right, well, that's all we've got today on The Shunned House. Sorry, folks, that we didn't like it that much. Hope we didn't bring you down. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, Michael Holmes for doing such a great job on the reading. Thank you so much for uh, being a part of the podcast. Today. Yeah, and uh, you made a great, you made a, a kind of bad story sound pretty good. Sound pretty darn good. Yeah. Next week, we Next are week. doing The Horror at Red Hook. The Horror at Red Hook, which is a sort of infamous uh, story because yeah. it's, yeah. it's got some pretty nasty social things that Lovecraft writes about in there. So yeah. it's a little so it'll be an interesting one to talk about it will be um, interesting to talk about stay tuned for that I am Chad Pfeiffer I'm Chris Lackey and this has been the HP Lovecraft Literary Podcast at hppodcraft.com hppodcraft.com